Welcome to another edition of Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Dale McGee. Technology is rapidly changing the practice of medicine, and one of the fastest growing areas is telemedicine, which is defined as the exchange of information via electronic means intended to improve a patient's health. Telemedicine is quickly becoming a part of healthcare services offered by hospitals, home health agencies, and physician offices. This edition of Physician Focus will discuss the advantages and disadvantages of these virtual visits. We'll look at how they affect both the physician and the patients, examine when it's appropriate and when it's not, and suggest how patients should regard this new approach to medical care. With me for this discussion are Dr. Stephen Locke and Dr. Adam LaCurcy. Dr. Locke is Chief Medical Officer and Co-Founder of iHope Network, a network of certified licensed clinicians to deliver cognitive behavioral therapy treatment via phone and video conferencing. He is also a primary care psychiatrist in the primary care telepsychiatry consulting service at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and a research psychiatrist in the Division of Clinical Informatics. He is also a member of the Massachusetts Medical Society's Committee on Information Technology. Dr. LaCurcy is an associate medical director at the Brigham and Women's Physician Organization and at Partners Population Health Management, and he practices primary care at the South Huntington Primary Care Practice. At Brigman Women's, he leads the hospital's telehealth strategy, which includes video-based ambulatory visits in primary and specialty care, patient portal-based e-visits in primary care, and provider-to-provider -provider virtual consultation through the hospital's e-consult program. Welcome, doctors. Thanks so much. Nice to be here. Great. So this is a really interesting topic, and I think what we're talking about is new, and yet it's based on something that everyone's familiar with, because everyone's called the doctor at one point or another. Everyone's had a conversation and tried to solve their problem over the telephone. And it sounds to me like what we're talking about is building on that. Yes. What do you think? What, how do we go about doing that? So I, I think it's a good place to start because certainly we're still using the telephone. We're still, you know, doctors have been connecting with patients for decades now, uh, you know, in between visits, after their clinic sessions, um, calling patients with test results and, um, you know, doing, uh, having certain conversations over the phone that, you know, don't require the patient to come all the way in. Um, what's happened over the last, you know, five or 10 years is that, um, those phone calls are still happening, but now there are all sorts of new uh, technology-based ways to connect to patients in addition to just calling them. So um, there are video platforms that we both use at our institutions to um, have face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, same-time interactions like, um, you know, using Skype on your telephone, but doing it in a secure way in a healthcare setting. Um, there are uh, different questionnaires and portal-based methods that we use through our, um, our computer systems, our me uh, electronic medical record systems. Um, and then uh, a whole host of other technologies, text messaging and um, connected devices, you know, uh, Bluetooth blood pressure cuffs and, and blood sugar monitors that feed, beta, uh, feed uh, data back to clinicians. Um, so it's really expanded, um, sort of you know, still using old technologies, but uh, using new technologies as well. And um, I think what's more interesting is sort of the, the workflows and, and uh, delivery changes around those technologies, the way that physicians are uh, you know, paid uh, to mm -hmm. do um, uh, different telehealth services, um, the way uh, systems uh, offer different telehealth services besides just telephone calls, um, and the different clinical uses that people are, um, are finding um, as they connect with patients in these, these new and, and varied ways. So this does a lot. This, I mean, it, it's new ways to connect with patients. So now before, when they were on the phone, you'd say, you have to come in, I have to see you. That's right. Now we can see them. Let, let me add something to yeah. that. Uh, um, remember in the olden days, uh, doctors made house calls. They right. visited patients at home. The telephone freed doctors up to be able to provide some care over the telephone to patients without having to go visit the patient or for the patient to visit the doctor. And at, at times, because of weather or other reasons, that, that was very difficult to do. So the telephone was a boon for being able to practice care remotely. When we hit the era of, of commercial health insurance and Medicare uh, in the middle of the 20th century and later, 
that changed the, the, the uh, playing field uh, a great deal because insurance companies and payers didn't want to pay for care delivered by the telephone. Mm -hmm. They felt that it was a uh, slippery slope and, and that it would be uh, difficult to monitor. I think there was concern about fraud. There was concern about it being overused. Uh, and uh, so nowadays, with telemedicine, the dividing point is the use of video. So insurance companies have been willing to reimburse for uh, video conferencing that's secure to provide face-to-face uh, -face treatment remotely for patients, but not for telephonic care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the compensation system sounds like it's catching up to the technology. Yes, it is. That's and right. it's also enabling the implementation Absolutely. of Absolutely. And, and I think it, the interesting part is um, that comes in two different flavors. There's sort of direct reimbursement for yeah. the kind of video consultations that, um, that Steve is talking about. And then there's um, sort of different ways that money is flowing to um, health systems um, yeah. to incentivize population health. So, um, you know, being accountable for a population of patients with sort of uh, an overall source of funding mm -hmm. and that all of a sudden gives providers an incentive to sort of connect with patients other than just bringing them into the office. So right. there's direct reimbursement and sort of indirect incentives because of the way um, Medicare and uh, commercial right. uh, uh, insurance companies are paying providers in a more global way. So just getting back to the technology though a little bit, yeah. it, it sounds like there are a lot of things that patients can now do in their home and communicate to their physician that wasn't possible before. You mentioned blood pressure cuffs that will transmit the information. Yes. I think you mentioned measuring the blood sugar. Yeah, there are a whole host of these, uh, people call it like uh, the Internet of Things or mm -hmm. you know, the, all the different devices that are connected through the Internet, internet mm -hmm. to, um, to healthcare providers. Those are just kind of two, of, two common examples, but um, you know, there are just a, a growing list of different you know, health apps and, um, and different devices that allow um, things that were sort of only able to happen behind brick and mortar, you know, uh, healthcare doors in the mm -hmm. exam room to now happen where patients spend 99% of their time at home and not mm -hmm. sitting in front of one of us. Mm -hmm. um, so devices, um, apps, uh, and uh, some of the programs we mentioned, the video platforms, the, the um, computer-based tools um, that connect directly to providers mm -hmm. um, are all different ways that people are connecting to patients other than just using the telephone. And it, it occurs to me that, you know, we worry about the efficiency of doctors working in their offices, how many patients they see in a day, that sort of pressure that exists. But for a, a 15 or 20 minute visit or whatever it is, for the patient, that involves a much greater investment of time. That's right. Sure. I, it, and if the patient has a condition which requires regular treatment, such as yeah. mental health conditions, which may require weekly treatment or even uh, two sessions a week, uh, if a person has to take three buses to get to a medical center or to a doctor's office, that's a real hardship. And there are other factors that can be barriers as well. Uh, not only might the person be f a frail elderly person or disabled, but they might have young children at home or they might be providing care for a, uh, uh, a parent uh, who yeah. uh, uh, might have Alzheimer's disease. And right. the ability to leave and, and go to a doctor's office can be a real hardship. Right. And, and that absolutely gets at the, the, the why of telehealth or telemedicine. At the end of the day, um, you know, the reason why uh, folks like us are getting excited about it and, and you know, other providers and healthcare systems is that um, it is just much, much more convenient for patients. The access to our care is improved. A lot of the barriers that Steve mentioned are reduced. Um, and we really think it's better care in a lot of ways, um, sort of less restrictive, um, you know, uh, higher access care. That in the higher access, I mean, you can follow your patients more closely, it sounds like. That's right. I, I think about it as, um, you know, before telehealth, um, we had just sort of a limited set of tools to see patients. We had the office visit, um, some providers used the telephone, some used email, but, um, but that was kind of it. Uh, you know, now with telemedicine, if certain patients um, just want to do a quick video chat from their office, they don't have to drive and park and pay for, you know, pay for gas, et cetera. Um, if they want to have a text-based encounter, some providers do that. 
um, for uh, uh, acute complaints or urgent care complaints, the questionnaire-based approaches that I mentioned, you know, you fill out 10 questions and send in a questionnaire, that's when, when you said an e-visit, that, that, that's what that is. So um, basically allows less of a sort of one-size-fits-all approach to caring for, you know, the 18-year-old patient with no medical problems all the way on up to an older patient with quite a few medical problems. Right. Right. Um, so allows us to kind of mix and match uh, our tools to the patient. You, you alluded to the issue of measuring outcome and the, the a patient's progress. I uh, met today uh, with uh, a group of nurses and pediatricians in a large group practice up in the North Shore, and part of the conversation that we had was that uh, that a telemental health program that provides treatment using secure video and which captures at regular intervals information from self-reports that patients provide during the interview enables us to provide feedback to the clinicians that they ordinarily don't get. So they may refer somebody out to a behavioral health clinician or to a psychiatrist. The first problem that they have is that they generally don't even find out if the person ever saw, saw the right. clinician. And, th and that's an overwhelmingly large problem. But even when they do, they almost never get any information back about the patient's progress. What telemedicine allows is for you to capture information during the encounter in some standard way and to keep track of that information and provide it back to the referring clinician or the collaborating clinician as part of a collaborative care process and then the clinician who's referring the patient gets to share the care of that patient with their doctor and to see how the patient is doing. Right, I, that's huge. Yeah. You know, as a practicing physician, I can say that feedback from the people I send my patients to was, was so critical to me and, and often wasn't as good as I, I would have liked. Right. And so you bring what, up a critical point. Yeah. What these pediatricians said was that uh, behavioral health clinicians are uh, uh, outliers in the uh, failure to provide feedback to the referring clinicians, that mm -hmm. other specialists are better at it. Well, and I, I'm glad uh, you made one point there that, um, you know, a lot of telehealth, so when, so when people hear the term telehealth, um, I think uh, most folks think of sort of different ways of connecting directly to patients. There are quite a few flavors that are provider to provider, which, um, which was what Steve was getting at. So, um, you know, we have a, a number of programs that allow generalist or primary care doctors to connect with other specialists mm -hmm. without having to shuttle the patient back and forth between multiple office visits. So I can send the, one of these e-consults that you mentioned hey, I've got a patient, you know, X, Y, and Z is going on. Not sure if I need to send this patient all the way to you. Um, can you, you know, give me some feedback, some help, so I can just take care of the patient myself? Right. So some of it is, you know, provider to patient, and some of it is provider to provider, um, using, again, different forms of technology. Right. And, and some of it can be patient to patient, because uh, when I was at um, uh, a large multi-specialty, multi-site group practice a number of years ago, running a program that was a group program for patients, a mind-body group program. Mm. Patients on average wouldn't travel more than seven miles to get to a center where they could be part of a group with other patients. And uh, so uh, that was very limiting and it made it more difficult for people to access the program. With with telemedicine, you can have a group of people, if, you've, if you solve the privacy issues, and they are solvable, if you address the privacy issues, you can have a group of people where everybody sees one another. You could have six or eight people who share a common condition or who are going through the same program to cope with living with a particular condition. And you can do that and make it very convenient for people and give them the support that they need. Yeah. Wow. So now we were talking about the, the various devices, the, the media, the, the timing, the fact that you can be asynchronous or at the same time. Yep. We talked about the, the home monitoring and the fact that there are a lot of devices that can transmit information that you used to have to go to the office to get measured. But, but you bring up another point, and that has to do with the mental health issues. And there's, there are lots of dimensions to that with regard to telehealth. Why don't we talk about that a little bit? It, it seems that there, there's uh, an issue regarding the willingness of a patient to see a, a clinician. There are issues regarding follow-up. Uh, and there are also issues regarding the supply of mental health providers, which right. are in short supply. Right. All of those issues are paramount in addressing the problem of delivering mental health services to populations in need. 
We know that about 25% uh, of people at any point in time have a mental disorder. And if you look at a, an average primary care practice, it's about 12 to 15% at any point in time. And if you take a condition like diabetes or congestive heart failure, those po patient populations have higher prevalence of depression. And we know that, that, that depression um, and associated uh, mental disorders, such as anxiety or substance abuse, uh, can compromise the uh, outcomes that those patients will get from the care they receive. It, it, it inter can interfere with pe patients' participation in their own care, such as checking your blood sugar if you have diabetes. And uh, the cost of care is higher for people with depression. So if we identify pe people who are at high risk, for uh, depression or other mental disorders, and we can provide accessible, easy, affordable treatment to them, and also share that information with their primary care clinicians so that it really is a partnership, a three-way partnership, sometimes four ways if, patient, if families are involved. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if everyone is involved in working towards creating opportunities for people to deal with those issues by delivering treatment to people at home, uh, we can get not only better mental health outcomes, but we can potentially get better medical outcomes as well. And, um, you know, as, as Steve is articulating, um, behavioral health or mental health has really been sort of the, the pioneering field for, for tele telehealth. It's really where a lot of these services um, grew from originally, partially because of, um, you know, low access to, to mental health mm -hmm. providers, partially because um, a lot of what um, psychiatrists and, and, you know, behavioral uh, providers can do um, is quite amenable to telehealth. You know, there isn't, um, a, you know, a, a physical, physical exam per se beyond, you know, different visual clues and, um, you know, some of the things that you observe um, mm -hmm. in the office. So, um, so there's, a, there's a spectrum and what's, what's happened is that, um, you know, behavioral health is still delivering quite a bit of telehealth, but now, you know, internists and specialists and, um, you know, surgeons and sort of the whole gamut of, of specialists are um, really building on what um, mental health providers have learned. S some of the the pieces, though, um, are still the case that, um, you know, the, the stigma, the access, um, you know, access right. to providers, um, privacy, some of the things that are sort of uh, even more important in mental health um, are generalizable to other specialties. Right. Um, privacy and, um, uh, and some of the legal issues are all uh, we, right. things we've learned from our right. behavioral health colleagues as it's spread. I mean, we know that there's stigma in other specialties other than mental health. I mean, people, if they have to get an HIV test or if they have to donate blood and they know that they might be HIV positive, get anxious and may avoid donating blood for that reason. So we know that stigma affects people's choices in care, but it's especially uh, onerous in the case of mental health because so many people, especially from certain cultures where it's uh, where it's more prob problematic than others, families other than Woody Allen's family, right. uh, uh, people are reluctant to seek care if they can get the care privately at home, uh, and if they uh, if they're uh, the whole process can be kept confidential, yeah. which it th theoretically can be. Uh, it creates opportunities for people to get access to treatment that they other, otherwise might not um, uh, at, uh, attempt to do. Right. So the possibility is there, and that's exciting uh, because, uh, again, I can tell you one of the hardest referrals to make when uh, in practice is to get someone to go to see a mental health provider. Why is they, that? They often don't want to go. Um, and um, as, as you had mentioned earlier, we don't hear that they didn't make that connection. And so uh, we may not be in a position to follow up on it. it right. There's yeah. a lot of difficulty there for one reason or another. So I guess the question is, is this opens up another possibility. Do, do you have the sense that this has helped to break down that barrier? Uh, yes, we feel that it has. Uh, we've been working with adolescents as part of a program that was funded by NIMH uh, that helped us to develop a program for adolescent depression that we uh, did in conjunction with pediatric practices mm -hmm. where uh, depressed adolescents were identified by their primary care doctors or nurses and, uh, and referred to our program. And this was a clinical trial at the time and uh, we were able to uh, provide private treatment for those depressed adolescents and they didn't have to be exposed to sitting in a waiting room where they might run into a classmate right. or they didn't have to uh, miss uh, hockey practice or or uh, choir. Mm -hmm. uh, they could actually get access to the care and so we, we uh, got feedback. We 
interviewed all of, the, all of the students who went through the program and we got feedback from them and they were uh, appreciative of the privacy that the program afforded them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I, I think it, uh, you know, the general lesson there is that um, telehealth is a, is a way to, you know, to meet patients where they are in a, in a more tailored way, in a more engaging way. So if a patient doesn't want to leave work and, you know, for a mental health problem or for any other kind of problem, they just want to, you know, connect directly to their provider, telehealth allows that. If a patient, you know, wants to be texting instead of coming in or, you know, filling out a questionnaire um, for some of the reasons you mentioned, um, you know, telehealth allows, uh, allows those connections to be made. Uh, some organizations have really excelled in their ability to deliver telemental health. There's a telepsychiatry program in the VA system mm -hmm. and because they don't have the problem of practicing across state lines because they don't have to be licensed to, in the state in which the, uh, the patient resides uh, if they're practicing at a VA facility. Mm -hmm. That means that, that the VA had an opportunity that other organizations haven't had to be able, for economies of scale, to be able to develop a program and distribute it nationally. Mm -hmm. And so a, a lot of the care for patients with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder who have been war fighters who came back with serious uh, uh, mental illness uh, affecting their themselves and their families. Uh, many of those people have been able to access treatment uh, even when they lived remotely uh, because of that program. Uh, it's more problematic for everybody else because of two things. One is the fact that uh, I have patients, for example, who are students who I treat when they're living at home here in Massachusetts, but if they go off to college in New York State, I can't continue to provide treatment to them, even though I could theoretically do that with telemedicine because I'm not licensed in New York State. Right. So, so that, that's one important uh, barrier. The other one is uh, that a lot of providers go by is not offering this to a brand new patient. So the, the out-of-state limitation is one thing, and then having a, an established relationship with the patient, just mm -hmm. so the first time you're interacting isn't over a questionnaire or, or video, but you're you know developing trust and rapport face-to-face uh, -face or in mm -hmm. person. Um, and then subsequent, or, uh, Steve mentioned, follow-up visits can be done through telehealth. So those are two important things to kind of keep in mind, the geographic uh, limitations and then the sort of relationship limitations. So the Congress is starting to address this, yes. and so is uh, CMS, the, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which oversees Medicare and Medicaid programs. Uh, because it's a big limitation, right? I mean, you could argue that the farther away you are from your provider, you know, uh, within the state or, you know, outside of your state or outside of the country, the more telehealth makes sense. And so mm. it's a little ironic to say this is really something we can just offer within Massachusetts when, in fact, the benefit is perhaps, you know, even greater the farther right. away you get from Boston right. or from, you know, uh, there, Massachusetts. There's another paradox, too, which I know you're aware of, yeah. which is that uh, Medicare's currently requires that if a patient is going to be, if, if a doctor is going to be reimbursed for telemedicine that they provide to a patient under Medicare, the patient has to go to a medical facility. The doctor can be at home in his slippers and bathrobe, <laughs> but, the, but the patient has to get up, get in the car and drive to yeah. a hospital or a clinic or a doctor's office. Right. So they've got it, they've got it backwards. Uh, the point is to make it convenient for the patient. And, and I will say, um, you know, the, the insurance details on this get quite complex, but the commercial payers who are starting to reimburse um, have taken a much more permissive right. approach than, than CMS and, and Medicare, so it's much more <coughs> consumer friendly. Right. right. So I guess with any new technology, with any new approach, there are always unintended consequences. There are always, you know, the other shoe drops after a while. Yeah. And so what are your concerns at this time? Where are, the, where are the boundaries of this new technology? How can patients or doctors go down the wrong path with yeah. this? I, I have three that, that come to mind whenever I think about this, and, and Steve probably has others. So um, one is the, the thing you said in the beginning, you know, you're talking to a patient and you say, oh, actually, you know what? You should really come in for this. Um, that, that can be a gray zone for a lot of providers. So um, there is um, a little bit of um, a, a quality concern or a sort of medical legal concern that if people aren't making good decisions about what kind of care should happen virtually or through telehealth and which, you know, which kinds of questions should come in, you know, in person, um, 
uh, they're, 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 that, that decision making could be fraught for you know, mm -hmm. in some in some instances, especially as telehealth is used by more and more kinds of providers. Now, the data on kind of the quality of care that's being delivered via telehealth does suggest that, um, for the most part, um, there isn't a, a decrease in quality. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends a lot on the situation and the kind of provider and the, the kind of questions that the patient has. So, so that's one piece. I think the two other quick ones are. Um, you know, we, we're both talking about access as a big reason uh, that, that we're embracing telehealth. Well, um, it's access for certain patients, right? So you have to, for you know, a video platform, you have to have a device that has a camera. You have to have access to internet. So there are some socioeconomic um, implications there. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of n not, not, not for everyone if you don't have the right technology. And so we don't want to offer this in a way that you know increases disparities within within care. And then I think the third piece is sort of. Is there something lost when you you don't see each other face to face? You know, trust or um, some other you know qualitative um, um, mm -hmm. piece of the relationship that um, that we take for granted that you know um, is important. It, mm -hmm. You know, that's meaningful when you see your provider in person. Yeah, as so, a psychiatrist, I yeah. hear that you could imagine I hear this a lot from colleagues, especially colleagues who are a little technophobic uh, right. uh, or, or who have a heavy investment in, in a strong tradition. Uh, uh, of uh, historical practice in mental health, which involves people sitting face to face uh, in the same room and uh, uh, and having kind of an open-ended conversation, which allows the patient to to talk about whatever they deem important. Um, most of what we're doing in our treatment programs is using evidence-based structured protocols, uh, and uh, and in that context, uh, we're a little bit less concerned about the subtleties of, of nonverbal communication. Plus, we can see people pretty much from the from the belly button up. And uh, if somebody is closed off and they're sitting like this, we can see it. If they have tics, we can see that. We can see emotions in their face. So an awful lot of nonverbal information, probably 85% of what we need, comes from that. Uh, and the offset is that we also, if we're having a conversation uh, in treatment with an adolescent at home and we hear screaming in the background yeah. or things crashing, uh, we get information about the, the yeah. home environment that otherwise we wouldn't get if the patient was in the office. So I think it's a trade-off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, this, is, this has been a great discussion. And uh, uh, Steve and Adam, I'd like to thank you both for coming to talk to us today about telemedicine. And for more information on telemedicine, visit our homepage at physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Dale McGee. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Dennis Dimitri. I'm Dr. Monica Burrell. Prescription drugs are valuable medicines, and when taken under a doctor's supervision, provide effective pain relief for many conditions. But the abuse of these powerful drugs has become a serious public health problem in Massachusetts and across the country, resulting in the needless deaths of thousands of people. If you are prescribed opioids or pain medication, talk with your doctor about the risks and benefits of the medicines and explore different ways to treat your pain. The safe use of prescription drugs comes when physicians and patients work together to promote healing and good health. Medicines cure, heal, and relieve pain. Use them carefully, store them securely, and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. What you do can make a difference. For more information, visit the websites of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health or the Massachusetts Medical Society.
I'm Dr. Elizabeth Goodman. Raising a happy, healthy child is every parent's priority. When your child has a fever or is injured, it's easy for parents to seek medical attention. It's not so easy when kids don't want to do homework or engage at school, are withdrawn or cranky, and tough to connect with, all of which could be normal or could be signs of mental illness. Mental health problems such as ADHD, depression, and anxiety are common among children and youth. In children, these problems often look different than they do in adults. So it's important that parents be aware of warning signs that can indicate mental health problems. Look for relationship problems with peers or family members, trouble fulfilling responsibilities like homework and daily chores, a drop in school performance, or mood changes that last for weeks. If you observe any of these signs, talk with your child's pediatrician. For more information, visit the American Academy of Pediatrics at HealthyChildren.org.